Monsters. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Murder Murder News podcast. We like to imagine these weekly episodes as weekly meetings for our very own true crime cult. But not to worry, you've landed in the cult with all of the flower crowns and none of the flavor aid. We just like to fantasize about getting away from the world with all of our true crime friends, gathering around a campfire and telling spooky stories about the subject that brought us all together, murder. If you don't know us yet, I'm Angelina, and I'm here with my peculiar pal, Aurora. How's your week? Uh, I feel like a new person today. Yeah, I am, <laughs> in a officially whole new moved. setting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm out of Budapest, which I do miss, but I am mm-hmm. in the Canary Islands, and it's beautiful and sunny today, and just not Amazing. having the idea of an international move looming over my shoulders has been such a yeah. release. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to just put those big things behind yes. you, even when you still have a lot on the go to be stressed about. It's like as soon as you can get over that big hump, you're like, okay, good. Uh, <laughs> I can still keep going. Done. Yes. Mm-hmm. And how about you? Well, interesting for sure. I went to um, my first concert um, since Ooh. the pandemic started. So that was a weird time. Um, I'm not built for this anymore, I've learned. I mean, I'm going to work my way back up. But I went out with a friend who um, had a baby about six months ago. So she um, had a little more of a legitimate excuse for being this way. But we both found that we were like um, falling asleep at 9 p.m. And we're like, come on, when is this thing going to end? And then as we left early, we're walking back to the metro being like, oh, my God, my back, my legs. How do we do this? (laughs) So like that was really rough. Um, It was also... A little more packed than I would have liked. And of course, like, you know, masks are, some people are doing it, some people are not. Everyone's trying to have a drink, everyone's trying to see a show. So, you know, it's a a lot to coordinate, I guess. But uh, I'm glad to have had my first taste, at least to get that behind me. Well, I'm glad you did it and still got to bed at a decent hour. That sounds great. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. (laughs) It was a really good show, too. It was someone that I've never heard of that um, I guess is a Quebecois artist that's called. Uh, called Laurence Anne. Um, mm-hmm. It was just really kind of trippy stuff with like saxophones that reminded me of um, the original Blade Runner soundtrack. Mm. And like um, the keyboardist was like um, singing like a banshee and like recording segments into her keyboard loops and working that into it. And like the main um, person, Laurence Anne, I guess, um, had an amazing voice. It was just like really a blanket of sound. So like that was a cool, uh, I almost got emotional at the beginning because I was like, music is so good. Watching live music is so good. Like I'm glad to have a, a small opportunity to do that. Amazing. Well, just by tuning into our show today, we of course consider you to be honorary monsters, but if you'd like to make it official, you can sign up to join the MMN commune on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash murder, murder news and pledge any amount you can spare to show your support for murder, murder news. To show you how much we appreciate you, we'll give you a shout out on the show. You'll get your own cool title like Grandmaster of Goats, and you'll have exclusive access to our regular patron-only content. We post special video episodes at the end of every month, and we're actually just about to post our episode for April, which is a look back at the history of April Fool's Day and some pranks gone awry. So if you're already a patron, make sure you tune in tomorrow. Let's kick things off with a look at some of the true crime stories making headlines this week. Two women were charged with the first-degree murder of a four-year-old in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, over the weekend. 53-year-old Roxanne Record, the little girl's grandma, and 29-year-old Kaja Record, the little girl's mother, were arrested after four-year-old China Record was found unresponsive in her home. According to investigators, China's grandma allegedly made her drink a bottle of whiskey while her mother watched. It's believed that China had unknowingly grabbed the whiskey from the counter to try a sip, and the grandma then made her drink the whole bottle to teach her a lesson. She was unresponsive when help arrived at the scene. She died of acute alcohol poisoning with a blood alcohol level of 0.68, which was more than eight times the legal driving level for an adult. To put it in perspective, for many people, a blood alcohol level of just over 0.1 can lead to impaired motor balance and blurred vision, and a coma is possible around 0.35. 
That is just uh, devastating. And I'm shocked that any of these people made it this far with a grandma's mentality like that. I'm surprised that, uh, you know, she didn't do something like that, raising her own children. That's uh, it's, wow. It's just so sad. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. I think that that's kind of a lesson I've heard of people trying to teach their children before, yeah. like if they get into the alcohol like smoke cabinet, a whole pack of cigarettes. Yeah, like that kind of thing mm-hmm. to gross them out. And but four is very young. It's for too that. young. She's clearly not trying <laughs> to drink alcohol. She's just like, what are no. my grandma and mom drinking here? And it's just right. such a terrible accident. And yeah. I'm sure they must feel just awful for Ugh. the fact that it happened, having lost grandkid and daughter, like just awful. Yeah, for sure. Well, on Sunday night, 10-year-old Lily Peters was reported missing in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, after she didn't come home from her aunt's house. Her bike was found in the woods not far from her aunt's house around 9.15 the same night. Unfortunately, Lily's body was found in a wooded area near a walking trail by the Lanin Kugel Brewing Company around 9 o'clock Monday morning. The cause of death has not been released, but police are treating Lily's case as a homicide. As of the day we're recording this, no suspects have been identified and police are investigating multiple leads. Please ask anyone with any tips regarding Lily to please call 1-800-263-5906. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break. Hello, and welcome to Cause of Death. My name is Jackie Moranti. I've been studying infectious disease for 14 years in various research settings. I have a Bachelor's of Science from Colorado State University in Microbiology, Immunology, and Virology. I've worked with diseases like tuberculosis, SARS-1, and SARS-CoV-2, better known as COVID-19, and I've worked with EHV-1. It's my feeling that if we look back at the pandemics of the past, we may be able to better handle the pandemics of the future. The problem is, we have to learn our lessons first. Come along with me while I tell you about the pandemics, the epidemics, and the outbreaks, and how we never seem to learn our lesson. And we're back. Before we dig in, we want to offer a quick disclaimer. Though we joke about forming a true crime cult, that is not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity, and we want you to know that we take the cases we're discussing very seriously. We want to deliver each story with the utmost respect to victims and anyone involved. If you feel we've missed the mark, you don't like our tone, or if you notice we've gotten any details wrong, let us know with a quick email to murdermurdernews at gmail.com and we'll make it right. Some specific trigger warnings for this episode include substance abuse, poisoning, alcoholism, and elder abuse. If any of those are particularly sensitive subjects for you, you may want to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. This week in true crime history marks the 40th anniversary of the murder of Ruth Monroe, the first of nine victims of serial killer Dorothea Puente, who targeted vulnerable populations who were elderly, homeless, struggling with addiction, and or had disabilities, believing no one would come looking for them. But Dorothea underestimated one very astute social worker who brought her whole murder and fraud scheme crashing down. Our sources for this week include court documents for Puente v. Mitchell, Worst Roommate Ever, World's Most Evil Killers, Deadly Women, Sacktown Magazine, and more. Check out our show notes for a full list of sources. Admittedly, Dorothea was thrown into the world under some pretty tough circumstances. She was born Dorothea Gray on January 9th, 1929 in San Bernardino County, California, as the sixth of seven children to Jesse James Gray and Trudy Gray. She was orphaned at a young age as her father died of tuberculosis when she was just eight, and her mother was an abusive alcoholic. Her mother lost custody of her children in 1938, then died in a motorcycle accident the same year when Dorothea was just nine. Dorothea and her siblings bounced from home to home of relatives to foster homes everywhere between Los Angeles and Napa. When she was 16, she set off on her own, heading to Olympia, Washington, where she became a sex worker. In 1945, at the age of 16, she married her first husband, Fred McFall. Fred was a 22-year-old soldier who had just returned to the U.S. after fighting in World War II. The two moved to Gardnerville, Nevada to start a family. 
They had two daughters together, but motherhood was not for Dorothea, who was just 17 at the time, to be fair. So she placed one of the girls in a relative's care and gave the other one up for adoption. Their marriage was short-lived, and the two separated in 1948, with Dorothea making her way back to San Bernardino. The same year, she was convicted of check fraud for the first, certainly not the last time, for writing fictitious checks. She served a few months in jail. Then in 1952, she married a sea merchant, Axel Johansson, in San Francisco. The two moved to Sacramento together and had a tumultuous marriage. Dorothea longed to be a part of Sacramento society and adopted different personas to fit in. She sometimes claimed to have connections to Swedish ambassadors and Rita Hayworth. She used the alias Taya Singoala Nayarda saying she was of Egyptian and Israeli descent. She would supposedly tell people she was medically trained and that she survived the Hiroshima atom bomb. Her husband was often traveling for work, and while he was gone, Dorothea was drinking, gambling, and having men over. In 1960, she was operating a brothel on Fulton Street under the guise of a bookkeeping service. She was arrested after she offered fellatio to an undercover cop dressed as a trucker. She served 90 days in jail. According to court files, Axel had her committed to a mental hospital in 1961 for excessive drinking, a suicide attempt, and a psychotic break. While in the hospital, she was diagnosed as a pathological liar with an unstable personality and placed on antipsychotics. The two parted ways in 1966 when Axel divorced Dorothea, but she claimed he was such a good-hearted man that he sent her Christmas cards in prison many, many years later. When Dorothea was 39, she married her third husband, Roberto Puente, which is of course where she got her last name. Roberto was from Mexico and said he married Dorothea for citizenship, and once again, their relationship was short-lived and very turbulent. Dorothea served Roberto with divorce papers citing domestic violence as the cause, but Roberto left for Mexico, leaving them still legally married until 1973. It was around this time that Dorothea opened an unlicensed alcohol rehab center at 21st and F Streets. Though her boarding house was unauthorized, it seems like it was actually somewhat of a success and did aim to help others, at least to some extent. The purpose of the boarding house was to act as a community to aid alcoholics, houseless people, and those with mental illness by holding AA meetings and helping tenants sign up for Social Security benefits. Running a community center gave her access to the elite circle she craved, and according to an interview with Sacktown Magazine, she made friends with California governors Pat Brown, Jerry Brown, and Ronald Reagan. She said she even had dinner with Clint Eastwood, who was tied to the California Republican Party sometime in the 70s. Dorothea created strong bonds in the Latinx community in Sacramento around this time. She spoke some Spanish, and keeping the last name Puente, she started telling people she was from Mexico, one of the many personas she adopted. She donated to Hispanic arts and education programs, and after claiming to be a nurse during World War II, she was given the name La Doctora. Dorothea was only in her 40s, but she started to craft her image of being an older matron by letting her gray hair grow out, which should be a very normal thing if you ask Mm. our opinions, but also wearing vintage clothes and wearing larger glasses that would have been more popular with older women during that time. While running her boarding house, she not only made friends with politicians, but also social workers and other charity organizations. Things were seemingly going well for her. She met her fourth husband, Pedro Montoldo, in 1976, but the two divorced the same year. The business did make money, but not enough for Dorothea. This is when she first cultivated her social security scam. As we mentioned, she would help her tenants sign up for Social Security and then forge their signatures to sign them over to herself. This scam also didn't go over well, and she was charged with fraud once again in 1978. She received probation this time and was forbidden from operating a boarding house. In 1981, Dorothea began renting the upstairs flat of a Victorian home located at 1426 F Street in Sacramento. The home was owned by Ricardo Ordorica, who lived in the downstairs half of the house with his family. Ricardo and Dorothea became so close 
that he would refer to her as his aunt, and she would refer to him as her nephew. Dorothea lived alone in her flat until 1982 when she met 61-year-old Ruth Clausen Monroe. You might remember that name from earlier because, unfortunately, Ruth would become the first murder victim of Dorothea. Ruth was a beloved mother of five kids with almost 20 grandkids. Four of her children lived around Sacramento and had always been close. She worked as a clerk in a downtown pharmacy called Temco for 13 years until she retired in 1980. By this time, her husband had passed away and a gentleman named Harold Monroe kept coming into the pharmacy to ask her out. She finally said yes and Harold would take her out to steakhouses and bars that Ruth didn't drink since she was allergic to alcohol. The two married in June of 1981. Harold liked to frequent a restaurant called The Flame Club where Dorothea happened to be working as a part-time cook. Harold introduced Ruth and Dorothea and the two became fast friends. Dorothea was so friendly that she even insisted that Ruth's kids call her grandma. In 1982, Dorothea had an idea to open a restaurant at a place called Round Corner Tavern in Midtown Sacramento. Ruth was already retired at this point and had some money saved up, so she decided to open the restaurant with Dorothea. Why not? The two were best friends. They ran the restaurant together, serving breakfast and lunch, and they seemed to be doing well, but Dorothea kept saying they weren't making enough money, pushing Ruth to put more money into the business. Dorothea was constantly asking her for more money, and after just a couple of months, they shut it down in early April of 1982. Around this time, Harold was diagnosed with terminal cancer and ended up living in the hospital full-time. Ruth, having always had her family around her, didn't like the idea of living alone. Since Dorothea had room in the house at 1426 F Street, she had the great idea that they could live together. The two were such close friends that this seemed like an ideal plan. So on April 11th, which happened to be Easter Sunday, Ruth's son, Bill Clausen, helped her move in with Dorothea. But once under Dorothea's care, things took a drastic turn for Ruth. Ruth's kids were still checking on her regularly, and her son Bill would stop to visit her every day on his way home from work. On April 24th, he stopped by to see her, and he was surprised to see a drink in her hand. We mentioned Ruth never drank and was actually allergic to alcohol. Bill asked her why she was drinking, and she told him Dorothea had made her a creme de menthe to help her calm her nerves. Ruth had been under stress with Harold's health in decline and with their restaurant recently shutting down. She was known for being upbeat, and a friend of hers who saw Ruth weekly to get their hair done together said out of the blue, Ruth seemed unwell on April 25th. Ruth had always been healthy and in good spirits, but according to this friend, she looked pale and was crying. She told her friend, I am so sick, I feel like I'm going to die. Her friend was worried, and she suggested Ruth go to the hospital. When she asked Ruth if she knew what was wrong, Ruth said she didn't know, but would talk to her later. The same night, Bill again stepped by to visit his mom, and when he got to 1426 F Street, Dorothea was at the kitchen table alone. He asked where his mom was, and she told him Ruth wasn't feeling well and was lying down. He said he would go check on her, and Dorothea told him to just let Ruth rest. He insisted on going up to see her, and when he got to her room, she seemed very sick. She had already looked pale earlier in the day at the hair salon, and now she seemed so unwell she wasn't talking. Bill sat on the edge of her bed, and Ruth looked up at him, her eyes open, seemingly watering, possibly crying. She did not speak. Bill wasn't sure what was wrong, but he did know Dorothea had been a nurse and he told his mom not to worry that Dorothea was taking good care of her. The next morning, April 26, 1982, Dorothea called Ruth's daughter to tell her she was dead. She told her to come and get Ruth's belongings. Bill's sister called him to tell him the bad news and he raced over to Dorothea's, unable to believe this could have happened. She was perfectly healthy days before. When he got there, Ruth had already been taken by the coroner. Dorothea told him Ruth had been so depressed she had completed suicide. Bill found this to be unbelievable since Ruth was so close to her children and grandchildren, had so much to live for, and had always been such a happy person. He asked for her belongings, and Dorothea handed over Ruth's purse, emptied. According to Dorothea, 
Ruth had told her to keep all of her belongings. Ruth had quite a bit of high-end jewelry, and another friend of Ruth said she had recently been to her house with $11,000 in cash in her purse she had gotten out of the bank. It was all gone. Ruth and Dorothea also had a joint bank account for the restaurant, and that had been emptied too. Bill and his family knew Dorothea was to blame for Ruth's death and went to the prosecutor to get justice for their mom. There were high amounts of drugs in Ruth's system at toxic levels. The mix included opiates, acetaminophen, and tranquilizers. The prosecutor believed it would be too difficult to prove Ruth had not completed suicide because Ruth had previously been prescribed opiates for pain and Harold had been prescribed tranquilizers. Dorothea had seemingly gotten away with murder, and her next move was to work with the elderly to provide in-home care, pretending to be a physician. She started rounding up her age by 10 to 15 years, carrying a medical bag with a stethoscope and other medical tools, and would administer medication to her patients. She had already gotten away with drugging Ruth to rob her, and this would become her M.O., During this time, she did not administer deadly doses, but just enough to paralyze her mark while she scavenged around their home for valuables. She had three female patients whom she drugged and then robbed of coins, jewelry, and checks. It appeared the women didn't piece together what had happened right away. They believed they had spells of illness that doctors could not pinpoint the cause. They later discovered that jewelry and checks had been missing from their homes, and a social worker who worked with these women did not trust Dorothea. In 1982, Dorothea met 74-year-old Malcolm McKenzie at the Zebra Club while out for a drink. Dorothea charmed Malcolm, and the two had drinks together. After their cocktails, Malcolm told Dorothea he lived nearby and invited her home with him. She agreed, but when they got back to his place, he suddenly felt strange and needed to lie down. He found himself paralyzed. He couldn't move a muscle, but he could see what Dorothea was up to. She was rooting through his apartment, looking again for cash, coins, checks, and even stole a ring off his hand as he lay there helpless. Malcolm went to the police and was able to identify Dorothea. She was charged with five felonies in connection with Malcolm and the three elderly women in 1982, but not for Ruth's murder. She was sentenced to five years in prison. But of course, Dorothea had already crafted her image as a harmless granny during this time, and she was paroled after only three years and was back on the streets in 1985. Before her release, she was evaluated by a psychologist who diagnosed her as schizophrenic. He noted... Quote, this woman is a disturbed woman who does not appear to have remorse or regret for what she's done. She is to be considered dangerous and her living environment and or employment should be closely monitored, end quote. While in prison, Dorothea had a pen pal. 77-year-old Everson Gilmuth had been writing to Dorothea and she told him that she had the time to think about what she had done and she really wanted to turn her life around when she was out of prison. The two became engaged to be married. We don't know much about Everson's early life, but we know he was a woodcarver who had been living in Oregon. Dorothea had convinced him to move to Sacramento so they could be together. During the time she was in prison, Dorothea's friend and landlord, Ricardo, continued to cash her government checks and keep her flat open for her for her release on September 9th, 1985. Everson left Oregon in August of 1985 with his truck and trailer, and on August 26th, he officially changed the address for his Social Security checks to 1426 F Street. Together, Everson and Ricardo went to pick Dorothea up from prison in Everson's truck to return to their new home together. Everson spoke with his sister for the last time in September, and Dorothea continued to send her postcards for months. She would let his sister know he was doing well or maybe having a small issue with his heart. In October of 1985, Dorothea started writing checks from a joint account between her and Everson. She wrote to his sister around this time to let her know the two would be married on November 2nd. And on the 2nd, she received a mailgram claiming to be from Everson saying he was heading to Palm Springs. Then, in November or December of 85, Dorothea hired a handyman to build a large wooden box for storage purposes. The dimensions of the box were to be 6 feet long, 
three feet wide, two feet tall, and should have a lid. Well, that's not concerning. No. (laughs) Super creepy. In exchange for the box, Dorothea forged Everson's signature, signing Everson's truck over to the handyman. He said he never saw Everson, just Dorothea, but didn't have a reason to believe she had forged a signature at the time. The handyman built the box in Dorothea's living room. The next day, the handyman came back over to 1426 F Street, and the box was now nailed shut and weighed almost 300 pounds. Dorothea asked the man if he could help her move the box to a storage unit. He agreed and moved the box with another friend to a dolly and out to the truck. They drove for about an hour, but at some point, Dorothea said they had driven too far and to turn around. Then she told him to drive off the road by the Sacramento River and told him to just throw the box in the river. He did as she requested and placed the box by the river. On January 1st, 1986, Everson's body was found in the wooden box abandoned next to a tree by a dirt road off of a levee alongside the Sacramento River in Sutter County. The box was found by a fisherman, and the lid had already been removed when he found it. His body had been badly decomposed, and he was dressed in a t-shirt and underwear. He'd been wrapped in bed sheets and plastic bags that had been sealed with black electrical tape. Unfortunately for Everson and his family, he wasn't identified at the time. He would be considered a John Doe for years. An autopsy was done, and there was no sign of trauma. Blood was taken for a toxicology screening, but it wasn't run at this time, as authorities had not connected his death to Dorothea. His cause of death wasn't determined. One of the reasons why I've always been attracted to true crime is that I spend a lot of time processing the worst thing that can happen and kind of planning my escape route if I were to be abducted or find myself on a scary Tinder date. But sometimes I get true crime overload, which leads me to setting up booby traps around my apartment, like I'm Kevin McAllister, self-medicating with wine, and struggling with falling asleep. I'm so glad that we talk about therapy so much in this community, and I've learned so much about cognitive behavior therapy from the work I've done and how I can use those tools to calm down when my mind is racing or imagining there could be a serial killer hiding in my closet. We've been using this great app, Nuna, that uses CBT methods in this cool chat function, which helps me get a hold of my thoughts and feel like a friend is helping talk me back to a more reasonable state of mind. You can try Nuna right now to help with your mental well-being and get 25% off when you use our link to sign up. Just go to landing.nuna.ai slash MMN or just click on the link in our show notes for your 25% discount. Let Nuna help convince you that the noise you heard outside your door is probably just your cat up to their usual hijinks. In mid-1986, Dorothea was on to the next evolution of her scam when she decided to again operate an illegal boarding house in the upstairs flat at 1426 F Street, officially violating her parole. It seemed she could not get away with robbing vulnerable people while they were alive as witnesses, but at this point, she'd already gotten away with two murders and decided that was a safer route. Her first tenant was John McCauley, who was 57 at the time, and would become a friend and possible accomplice of Dorothea. For a while, Dorothea rented out rooms in the upstairs flat while her friend, Ricardo, stayed in the downstairs of the house with his family. In May of 1987, the Ordericos moved out and Dorothea rented the downstairs rooms of 1426 F Street to tenants who were largely alcoholics, but many were houseless and had disabilities, and all of them, of course, were receiving Social Security. Dorothea, again, had a good reputation in the community. She provided meals, laundry facilities, and a safe home for individuals to live. She would sometimes provide bus or cab fares for tenants to get to medical appointments and help them keep track of their appointments on her calendar. She told others that she was skilled in caring for elderly individuals and that she was a, quote, MD doctor. (laughs) She even had a weekly burrito night where she would cook for the community. Uh, Dorothea, the D stands for doctor. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right. In the fall of 1986, 78-year-old Betty Palmer moved into the upstairs of the house. 
Betty was known for being private. She'd been diagnosed with several psychiatric disorders and was being treated with an antipsychotic drug at the time. In 1985, she had recovered from a hip injury and had seemingly developed an interest in pain medication as a result. It's unknown how long Betty stayed with Dorothea, but she disappeared in 1986. In December of 1986, 78-year-old Leona Carpenter moved into 1426 F Street. According to Dorothea, the two had known each other for 29 years, though it's unclear how. Leona had struggled with substance abuse, and in October of 1986, she was hospitalized for what may have been a suicide attempt, but it's also possible something more sinister. At this point, she signed over power of attorney to Dorothea. She stayed with Dorothea for a couple of weeks, but returned to the hospital for health issues. In February of 1987, she returned to Dorothea's and disappeared a few weeks later. A week after that, Leona's daughter came to check on her, and Dorothea told her Leona had gone to a nursing home. She told her other tenants Leona had left to go live with her daughter. 62-year-old James Gallup moved into the house in February of 1987. James was struggling with alcohol addiction and had recently gotten out of the hospital after surgery for a non-malignant brain tumor. He arrived at the house in a very frail state and with a patch over one eye, which was partially closed due to his tumor. On July 20th, 1987, James returned to a doctor for a tumor in his colon and discussed undergoing further testing. James didn't end up scheduling his follow-up tests, and the doctor's office called 1426 F Street. Dorothea told them James had gone to Los Angeles indefinitely. Dorothea told a friend of his that he had vanished in the middle of the night and then told a friend of hers that he had died unexpectedly. On October 2nd, 1987, social worker Peggy Nickerson placed her client Vera Martin at Dorothea's boarding house. Peggy believed Dorothea was doing good work and she had placed a total of 19 of her clients with her because Dorothea was willing to accept so-called difficult patients that no one else would take. Vera was 61 and was known for being verbally abusive. She was dealing with alcohol addiction and though she wasn't close with her children, she would always call them on their birthdays no matter what. On October 19th, she didn't call her daughter for her birthday and on November 11th, she missed her son's. She was not heard from again. In the fall of 1987, Dorothea hired 11 former inmates from a nearby halfway house to do some yard work at 1426 F Street. During this time, Dorothea ordered a bunch of 90-pound bags of cement, plastic ground cover, and carpet. John McCauley oversaw the parolees as they dug trenches and holes around the yard and built a shed. The workers said they didn't ask any questions about what the holes were for, so long as they were paid. 65-year-old Dorothy Miller moved into 1426 F Street on October 21st, 1987, and was also placed there by social worker Peggy. Dorothy was also known for being a bit difficult. She was an alcoholic and had been paranoid and combative. She had a history of suicide attempts and violent behavior. On October 22nd, Dorothy was cited for theft after shoplifting two packets of cigarettes. Peggy stopped at the house on the following week to help her deal with her citation. On October 23rd, Dorothy had an appointment with a gynecologist and was scheduled for a follow-up on November 23rd. Dorothy did not show up for her appointment, and Dorothea told Peggy she had checked into a hospital for treatment for alcoholism. Not long after, Dorothea again hired the former inmates to do some cleaning in a room she identified as being Dorothy's. The floor looked dirty, as though someone had thrown up. She had the carpet removed because there was a pile of foul-smelling slime. She told the cleaners the room was haunted. Peggy placed another client, 55-year-old Benjamin Fink, with Dorothea on March 9, 1988. Benjamin also dealt with alcoholism and struggled with mobility as a result of a car accident from 1980, causing him to use a cane. Benjamin lived with Dorothea for a couple of months, and his brother would come visit him every week for about six weeks. His brother saw him for the last time in late April. One of the tenants recalled a day around that time where Benjamin had been drinking. Dorothea said she was going to take him upstairs to, quote, make him feel better. Dorothea told others that she had asked Benjamin to go back home to Marysville sometime that summer because he was always falling down drunk. 
On April 29, Dorothea again had inmates over for yard work and she had ordered 12 bags of cement. She had them dig more holes and then fill them in. One had carpet in it and she told the workers it was trash. She had them put cement in front of a metal shed and a few days later, more cement, five feet in front of that, and then more under a gazebo in the yard. The workers noticed a foul-smelling odor in the yard. 51-year-old Alvaro Bert Montoya moved into 1426 F Street in early February of 1988. He was born in Costa Rica and had moved to New Orleans with his family in his teens. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was 16, and his parents believed the right move for him was to check him into a mental health facility for shock therapy. Mm-mm. Yeah, not good, but <laughs> at the time, like you can tell from the stories, his parents were like very loving parents. They just didn't know better, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just that the the medical professionals at the time that I guess right. they blame for doing that wrong. <laughs> but... Right. So when he was released from treatment, he left New Orleans without telling his family. They continued searching for him for years, wanting to help take care of him. Bert made his way to California and had been living largely on the streets. He was known as being a gentle giant and was well-liked. He ended up staying at a rehab facility for alcoholism, even though he wasn't an alcoholic. The facility just really liked having him around, and they worried that a mental health facility would not treat him well. Bert was assigned to social worker Judy Moises, who clearly cared so much about her job and is a real hero in this story. Judy wanted to make sure Bert was getting the best possible care, and though she agreed with the rehab facility that Bert might not thrive in a mental health facility, he might get better treatment for his mental health with the proper care. She heard about Dorothea Puente from other social workers and heard it was a wonderful boarding house with a caring woman who took good care of her clients. Judy talked to Bert and asked how he would feel about trying a boarding house. Bert was willing to give it a go, so Judy went to 1426 F Street to meet Dorothea. Immediately, she was impressed with how sweet Dorothea was. Dorothea had a box of kittens at the house and was bottle feeding them. She really did seem so kind and caring. Judy toured the house and even talked to some of the tenants. Resident John Sharp said, quote, There are a lot of pluses to staying here. Maybe it's just a room, but to have a nice place, have some really nice food, it works out very well for us. Judy complimented Dorothea on how impressive the home was, and Dorothea replied, Well, you know, I'm independently wealthy. I just have these people here because I like helping people. Right. (laughs) Bert agreed to move in with Dorothea, and he seemed to really be thriving in the beginning. He made friends in the house, had his own bed, recliner, and TV. Bert had a favorite local hangout where he would frequently go for a burrito and a couple of beers. Locals said he never seemed to be drunk from drinking. He just liked to have a couple of drinks. He went to the bar around August 6, 1988 and had a burrito and a beer. He was sitting on a bar stool, but when he got up, he fell to the ground. The owner called Dorothea to let her know Bert needed help, but she wasn't home. Two men came to help him home, and Bert never returned back for his burritos. On August 24th, a neighbor saw Bert in the neighborhood, but he was never seen again. Around this time, Dorothea started telling other tenants that Bert had gone down to Mexico to visit her brother for a fiesta. And let's remember that Dorothea was pretending to be from Mexico. She was not, and to my knowledge, she did not have a brother brother in Mexico. Yeah. Mm -mm. Judy had regularly checked in on Bert, but around this time, he stopped coming to the phone. Dorothea had told her the same story about Bert heading to Mexico for a party, which just didn't sound like Bert to Judy. In October, Judy took a more forceful approach with Dorothea. She told her Bert was in danger of losing his social security benefits if he didn't return home from Mexico by November 1st, and she needed him to check in. On November 1st, Judy showed up at Dorothea's to check on Bert, and he wasn't there. Dorothea told her she would go down to Mexico to get Bert and would be back with him on Saturday. Judy would not relent. She went back to Dorothea's on Monday, and Bert was still nowhere to be seen. Judy reported Bert as missing on November 7th, and a police officer went to 1426 F Street to check on him. She told the officer... Bert had gotten back from Mexico three days earlier, but then left to go with his brother-in-law. 
The police chatted with some of the tenants at 1426 F Street, and they confirmed Dorothea's story that Bert had gone to Mexico and had then left with his brother-in-law. But John Sharp, the same tenant who had told Judy this was a great place to live, slipped a note written on the back of an envelope to an officer. The note said, she wants me to lie to you. John met up with officers in secret and told them that he didn't know exactly what had happened to Bert, but he knew the story Dorothea was telling wasn't the truth. He said she told him, quote, John, I'm going to ask you to lie for me today. I think I'm going to jail. I want you to tell them I was gone Thursday and Friday and that you saw Bert on Saturday. And she said, I'll make it well worth your while. John had not seen Bert for at least two months at this point. It was clear Judy was not going to back down and Dorothea needed a more solid plan to throw her off her trail. Dorothea asked one of the inmates, Donald Anthony, to both call and write to Judy pretending to be Bert's fictitious brother-in-law named Mikel Obregone. Anthony or Mikel called to say he had picked up Bert and brought him to live with him in Treeport, Utah and to live with their family. Judy was not buying it, so she asked to speak with Bert. Mikel said Bert couldn't come to the phone because he wasn't feeling well. She immediately called Dorothea to tell her about the strange phone call and said she was going to the police. Judy went to the police armed with a letter sent from Dorothea slash Anthony slash Mikel with the same wild story and insisted they investigate further. She also suggested they bring shovels because she had seen mounds of dirt that looked like graves. On November 11th, a detective, John Cabrera, went with his partner and Dorothea's parole officer, armed with three shovels, to check out these mounds. When they got there, Dorothea said, I was expecting you guys. When asked what she was doing in the house, she let her parole officer know that she had been violating her parole by operating a boarding house. She repeated the same story about Bert going to Mexico and then with his brother-in-law to the officers. Dorothea permitted the officers to look around, and they kept finding empty blue pill capsules, but nothing else that seemed suspicious. Dorothea was just 61 at this point, but she had really been selling the gentle grandma routine for a while. And at this point, it would have been hard for anyone to believe that Dorothea could have anything to do with Bert's disappearance, unless you were Judy. The detectives told Dorothea they hadn't found anything suspicious in her home, but asked if they could do a little digging in her yard being sure to put things back as neatly as they could. Dorothea responded, whatever for? John told her they just wanted to go back to the social worker and tell her they had searched high and low and that Bert wasn't there. Dorothea basically responded, why don't we do this? I know you have a lot to do at work. Why don't I call someone to come over and they'll do this for you? John insisted they do a little digging and Dorothea let them as she watched from the upstairs balcony. The three men began digging and initially just found trash like eggshells, paper, and cigarette butts. They started to find something that looked like pink cloth and something that looked like leather. They kept digging until they hit about three feet deep when they hit something John assumed was a tree root. He tried to chop it with a shovel, but it wouldn't give way. He reached down to try to pull the root free and suddenly it dislodged itself as he found himself holding a human femur. Of course, the leather would later prove to be human flesh. You, Yeah. Dorothea was still watching from upstairs and became visibly upset, covering her mouth and saying, is that what I think it is? Dorothea was not arrested, but brought in for questioning. She told John that other people had lived there long before her and she'd only been there since getting out of prison. All of Dorothea's tenants were brought in for questioning because it really wasn't immediately obvious that it was Dorothea. She looked like a tiny older lady who was completely harmless. Even if she wasn't harmless, how could she have killed and disposed of these bodies with her small size? This is actually a good question, which we'll come back to later. John pushed Dorothea further and said, I'll bet if I keep digging, I'll find more bones. Dorothea said, if you do, I didn't put them there. She was emotionless during the interrogation and just kept insisting the bone was old and couldn't have been placed there by her. There wasn't anything to hold Dorothea on. And in fact, because this body was so decomposed and Bert had only been missing for three months, there was still no evidence she had anything to do with his disappearance. The next day, the dig continued with an anthropologist from San Diego. 
Dorothea went to John Cabrera and said she was feeling anxious and asked if she was under arrest. He told her she wasn't, and she asked if she could go get coffee at a nearby hotel where her nephew was. John Cabrera and her tenant, John McCauley, walked her to the hotel together, worried that the media that had gathered to observe the dig might bother poor little Dorothea. There's a famous photo of Dorothea heading for her coffee in a red coat, some low heels, tidy gray hair, her glasses, and a pink umbrella looking very harmless. About 20 minutes after John Cabrera walked Dorothea for a coffee, their dig unearthed a second body. At this point, they had more questions for Dorothea and want to get her from the hotel for a chat. To no one's surprise, Dorothea was not there. It turns out she wasn't really looking for a coffee to calm her nerves. She headed straight to a bar with John McCauley, and they had a few drinks before parting ways. John left after about 15 minutes, and after an hour, Dorothea asked the bar manager to call her a cab. The taxi took her to Stockton, where she hopped on a bus bound for Los Angeles. The dig continued for another two days, unearthing the bodies of seven of Dorothea's victims, all of which had been tenants at her boarding house. Bert's body was the third found. The bodies had been in fetal positions, wrapped in sheets, tablecloths, and plastic, and buried in holes in the ground, or some under cement. One of the bodies was missing the head and hands, which have never been located to this day. Even with the decomposition of some of the bodies, toxicology was able to reveal that all victims had been drugged with a tranquilizer, Dalmain or Florazepam, 24 to 48 hours before death. None of the victims had been prescribed this drug, just Dorothea. The drug was particularly dangerous when mixed with alcohol because it was known for causing paralysis, and with a high enough dosage, it would stop the heart. A bolo had been issued for Dorothea immediately, and she was on the run for days. Dorothea had gone to a bar on November 16th where she chatted up an older guy, Charles Wilgays. She bought him a drink and started talking to him about the amount of his social security checks. She told him he should be getting more and offered to make him Thanksgiving dinner if he wanted to move in with her. She said her name was Donna Johansson and gave him the phone number for her hotel. Charles then saw Dorothea on TV in relation to seven murders in Sacramento. He turned her into the police and she was arrested on November 17th. She had over $3,000 in her purse, which would be about $7,000 today. Dorothea's case was big news. Her story made it all the way up to Washington State, where Everson's sister now had good reason to believe her brother's fiancé had actually killed him. Shortly thereafter, Everson was finally identified as the John Doe found in a homemade wooden box by the side of the Sacramento River. Ruth's children also heard about Dorothea's arrest in the news and again approached the DA about reopening their mother's case. Dorothea was officially charged with all nine murders of Ruth, Everson, Betty, Leona, James, Vera, Dorothy, Benjamin, and Bert. Her trial began in 1992, and of course the question was raised, how did Dorothea pull all of this off on her own? Detectives initially suspected that John McCauley was an accomplice, but later dropped the charge against him. Detective Cabrera still believes to this day that she had at least one accomplice, and a lot of people think it could have been him. Mm. The witnesses did point out that Dorothea was putting on an act with being old and frail and that she actually was quite sprightly. One of the parolees had seen her carry a 90-pound bag of cement, which would be a lot of weight for me to carry, but also, like, I'm not that much younger than her than uh, the day she was pretending to be older. So, yeah, (laughs) uh, I could not do that. So it also seemed as though she could have been tricking others into doing some of the dirty work for her, like we know about the guy that helped build and move the box for her. Mm -hmm. There was a solid case against Dorothea with over 130 witnesses called by the defense and damning toxicology reports, yet one of the jurors was just not convinced. He did have a soft spot for Dorothea and her gentle act and would only agree to charge her with three of the murders and the judge declared a mistrial for the other six. She was found guilty of first-degree murder for Benjamin and Dorothy and second-degree murder for Leona. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Bert's mother was 92 years old at the time of Bert's murder and was still alive. 
She was heartbroken to find out what had happened to Bert, but it brought her peace to finally get answers after searching for him for so long. Ruth's family was also glad to finally get their day in court. They were disappointed that Dorothea was not found guilty of her murder, but were glad she was behind bars nonetheless. Dorothea continued to live life in the spotlight for years to come. In 2004, she released a cookbook called Cooking with a Serial Killer, which included recipes like her rather infamous burritos and chicken pot pie. We won't be trying that one. Nope. I'm actually surprised she was able to do that. Like, does that somehow, is there some kind of loophole there because, uh, you know, the laws about not being able to profit off of your crimes? Like, being like, this is the recipes of a serial killer seems a little bit... uh, like profiting off of your crimes. It but. does. And, you know, it's not like that in every state. I'm not sure how it is in California. Oh, right. um, I didn't, right. It didn't occur to me to look that up. But I do know that it was published not under her name, but someone else's name. Okay. So, um, and I feel like it could be, there very well could be a loophole because yeah. she's not writing about the crimes, it's you know? True. So it's that's true. She's not directly rela- um, profiting from the crimes. Yeah. Hmm. In 2009, she was interviewed by Martin Coos from Sacktown Magazine in what he described as a pretty chilling experience. It's one of our primary sources for this episode, so definitely check it out in our show notes. Dorothea maintained her innocence until the day she died, and she was quite evasive about her crimes with Martin. He asked her, how does it feel to be known as a murderer? To which she replied, I don't give a shit what anyone else thinks. Dorothea died in prison on March 27th, 2011, at the age of 82, from natural causes. As Sacramento residents are well aware, her house still stands at 1426 F Street, where many still pass by every day to get photos. The latest tenants, Tom and Barbara Holmes, purchased the house at an auction in 2010 for $215,000, a price way under market value. It's no surprise that no one wanted to buy a house where seven people were murdered. Unlike the homes of many serial killers, the house could not be torn down because the two-story Victorian home was built in the 1890s and is considered a historical site due to its age. Barbara and Tom had the goal of, um, I also want to mention there that some sources, including Zillow, say the house was built in 1968. And I was like, okay, that doesn't really make any sense if it's not that old to be a historical site. But I did find something on like an official historical site, uh, sites of Sacramento page that confirmed it was 1895. So I believe that information is accurate. Well, if it was Victorian style, chances are it wasn't built in the 60s. Agreed. But California does like to do some kind of like older style architecture that's like a little bit okay. newer. So it could have been like a replica kind of style to fit in with uh, the neighborhood, but that was not the case. It does appear that it was actually an old house. Wow. Barbara and Tom had the goal of making people forget what the house had been and did a substantial remodel. That 100% did not work and people continued to park themselves in front of the house for seances and photos. At some point, the couple decided to embrace the horrific history and now have a mannequin dressed as Dorothea on the porch in a red coat with a shovel. They have signs around the house saying things like, trespassers will be drugged and buried in the yard and do not park across the driveway. The ghosts like to get out to terrorize the neighborhood. Tom's philosophy is that humor is great for healing. And while I can understand the need to survive dark times by making light of things, I feel like maybe just keep some of that to yourselves in a situation where the crimes are this recent. Um, I know Mm. that some of the families of the victims still live in Sacramento, and it seems pretty insensitive to have, you know, people driving by and seeing this mannequin of Dorothea with a shovel on your porch. So I don't like, I get where he's coming from, but maybe tone it down a little bit. (laughs) I I feel like it's a, I I don't know what to think about that. I mean, I find it somewhat um, amusing that they leaned in because uh, I guess, I don't know, maybe they thought um, it would be easier to sort of do a flip and make it seem like not a murder house. And then um, like they could have, like I picture they could have been going broke and being like, this isn't working. We're not, (laughs) you know, managing to achieve this. Like, what can we do to turn this around? And uh, it's kind of interesting that they did take that angle. It is a little disrespectful given the time. You know, and like the DA, 
I had been to the house and the DA obviously was very connected to this case and was like, what are you doing? This is so terrible. Like whatever. And that kind of like, as soon as I heard that, I was like, no, this it's too soon. It's just, you know, like a a ghost joke I can understand, you know, and like allegedly the house could be haunted by Dorothea. So I can understand Mm -hmm you know, like making light of her haunting the house or something to some extent, mm-hmm. but the sign but saying they're, you'll they're be drugged and buried tragedy. in the yard, like that's yeah. way too far. I think that's, it's, it's insensitive. I feel like the only way it could be um, made a little bit like more palatable is uh, if they, uh, if they like took the proceeds and donated it to something like the the victim's families or something like that, then it would be a little bit more um, acceptable. But uh, with them just profiting off of this tragedy that they weren't involved in. Profiting off of it. I think they're just, people were taking pictures and they decided to play into it. And I think that the husband just kind of has a quirky sense of humor, which, you know, I have a dark sense of humor. I get it. But just knowing that, you know, I know that um, I think it's Bill is... Ruth's uh, son. I know he still lives in Sacramento, and yeah. I just, I just don't. I don't know. I, I think it's it might not, be better thing to do like a hundred years in the future. Right, <laughs> like, right. yeah. <clears throat> um, so, anyways, nonetheless, um, I mentioned the ghosts and stuff. You can hear more about the house itself because you may have noticed how many times we reference fourteen twenty six F Street. It's like the house really does have its own like version of the story, like its own lens and all of this. And it is its its own character Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, And there are episodes of Murder Flip House about the house. Uh, And I know Ghost Adventures did an episode about the house, which I watched. I think Ghost Hunters is the other show. And I think they did too, but I couldn't find that one. Um, And there are certainly legends of um, Dorothea haunting the house now at this point since she's passed. I wonder if uh, if what the timing was like for the Ghost Adventures episode, like if there's any um, crossover there with the story we did about the Constantinos ghost hunters who were on Ghost Adventures all the time. That is a good question. Uh, this mm. episode came out, I think, around 2015 or 16. They had already died. Okay. They did have mediums on the show, which was definitely um, quite creepy. Like the medium... They, they brought them in with blindfolds so they couldn't tell what house they were approaching. And, you know, supposedly hmm. they weren't told anything about whose house they were in or where they were, that kind of thing. Like, who knows how true wow. that is if the mediums had time <laughs> to research this. But the mm-hmm. medium was picking up on a large man, like a presence of like a very tall man uh, with an AB name, which would have been Al- Alvaro or Bert, like, wow. you know, certainly. And, you yeah. know, if you were to look into, if you were to like try to believe this was true. And, mm-hmm. um, and it was, there was like an interesting moment where the guy, when he, you know, like felt as though Bert might be inside of him, um, said that the kitchen had moved. And he kept saying the kitchen had moved. This isn't how I remember it. And then Mm -hmm. I guess Detective Cabrera had talked to Ghost Adventures and told them that during the remodel, they had moved, removed a wall from the kitchen. And that was what he was picking up on. And in the room where, which is known as the death room labeled by detectives where, um, where Dorothea had killed her victims and let them stay, um, Mm -hmm. that the guy said, like, once he walked into that room, he said, I feel heavy. I feel like I can't move. I feel like I've been drugged, like whatever. So it was, it was pretty, if it, if it's real and part of me does like believe in mediums to some extent, um, if it was real and if they didn't know what was happening, it was pretty creepy to watch. Well, amazing job, uh, especially digging into the um, the histories of the different uh, victims and where they came from and how they wound up there, because uh, I, I know there's a lot of that missing from a lot of uh, reports about this story. And this is just like a a mind-blowing case to me. Yeah. Like I first heard of it on the the Worst Roommate Ever um, series. And while I was watching that, just the way that she... Um, made herself out to be like older and frailer right. <laughs> is just like so disturbing because of course, um, so manipulative. of course that worked on people. Yeah. yeah. Very, very manipulative to be able to just live your days, all of your days as an old lady when you're 
40. Right. <laughs> it's just wild. But like dedication to uh, whatever twisted shit she had going on, I guess. For sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Um, you know, I've actually heard this case quite a few times. And my concern in covering it is that it has been done a lot. Um, and I, you know, we do try to find more unique cases that people haven't heard yeah. about as often. Um, and was sticking to our theme of crimes that happened this week in true crime history. There just wasn't anything that I could find that was a lesser known <laughs> crime that was like this or Andrew well, Cunanan. And I was like, gosh, they're both so big. Yeah, um, I, don't know. I, I think that's totally fine once in a while because I definitely think like when we, like we have covered a handful of, uh, of big, you know, sensational cases. And when we do, um, I guess the best thing about it is just to bring a fresh angle or tell some, you know, more of the victim stories than is usually heard or just like, um, you know, some misconceptions about the case and stuff like that. So I think that it's always worthwhile to open even a huge case that's been done to death because there's always more. Yeah, to I it, agree. You know? And when I looked back at this case, I realized that I'd only ever really heard much about two of the victims. And yeah. uh, that was Bert. And that's because his amazing uh, social worker, Judy had really pushed and pushed and pushed to have him looked into and really cared about him. And then Ruth, um, her family is also often interviewed about her death. Wow. And I was like, wait, there's nine victims. I've never heard any of their other names. And I even and at first had a hard no time small finding number, them. Like, yeah. Mm. Right. And so, wow. um, so I thought that might be a way to approach this is make sure that those people, um, that their stories are remembered too. And it was Absolutely. not super easy to find information mm -hmm. about them. I would have loved to have more background about them, but um, mm -hmm. we would like to remember them too, of course. Yes, for sure. So what have you been watching? Uh, you know, I finally had a little bit of time for <laughs> television this mm -hmm. weekend. And the nice. only thing sort of in the vein of spookiness w that I watched is Russian Doll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you watched it yet? I, I finally started it last night. I watched, I think, two episodes, but I did a really silly thing first um, <laughs> because it was just like, I don't know what, how long ago I watched the um, the first season, right. but I guess there was like not record of that on my Netflix. So I clicked, oh, the second season. And I just clicked like, watch now. And I'm watching it and I'm watching like, two thirds of the freaking episode before I'm like, <laughs> I was like, you know, it's really interesting how they recreated the exact same characters so perfectly. And then I'm like, oh, she's, I guess, revisiting the same scene to be like, huh, now I know more and this, you know, <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, she's going back for that guy again. And then I get two thirds of the way through and I'm like, I'm watching the first fucking episode oh, of the no. first season. What is this? <laughs> I guess it's been a few years. So yeah, it's that been a was, while. Uh, I actually want to rewatch the first season. <laughs> Yeah, so that, I was going to say it was an unintended refresher. Um, but then after that, I watched uh, the first couple episodes of the new season. And wow, then I had um, feverish dreams. I was a little sick last night. And somehow, uh, while I fell asleep watching this, I had a dream where I was like, oh, yeah, obviously I'm sick because I'm nine months pregnant and smoking a pack a day. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> That's not... <laughs> I'm not in this. I'm neither mm. of those things. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. Yeah, it's great. I've heard some like mixed feedback about the second season. I really enjoyed it. I won't give any mm -hmm. spoilers. Like it's like a different time travel scenario. Thing? Yeah, I've watched the whole second season. Oh my goodness. It's only seven episodes. <laughs> wow. Um, mm -hmm. I downloaded it on the plane when, and I had like mm. eight hours of flights. So I had okay. quite a bit of time to like knock out some things on while I was flying. Yeah. But um, it's great because I'm feeling a little bit homesick for Budapest right now. Like I've landed mm -hmm. in this beautiful place, this like beautiful island, but I'm alone in a hotel all day without a mode of transportation. Mm. It's like small and doesn't mm. have like buses and stuff. So I don't really know how to get around here yet. Mm. And, um, and I like was working on researching Dorothea like all weekend. So I was like, okay, yeah. I'm going to have some downtime and finish watching Russian Doll. And a lot of it was shot in Budapest, which I knew because uh, I had friends who worked on the show. And I thought maybe that was like a budgetary thing that they had just like filmed there to try location. to make it look like New York. Like that happens quite a right. bit. Um, a lot right. of like a lot of things shoot in Budapest right now because of their tax credits. And, um, huh. But no, it's actually a lot of it is based in Budapest it's and she's traveling to Budapest yeah. like in the past around World War II era Budapest and then mm -hmm. current day. 
and hearing some places that I've been to. And wow. also she's like speaking Hungarian, Hungarian. and like people are speaking Hungarian. I'm like, I know some of these words. And like, it was very yeah, soothing. And they're talking <laughs> about like sort of uh, historical thing, like because her family lineage is yes. uh, Hungarian and stuff, right? So with the grandmother Which, and all I of this. I I've never seen a Hungarian with red hair, but perhaps it exists. But <laughs> Well, she probably dyes her hair. Well, oh, the grandma you mean, uh, has red hair too and the mom. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, I guess that's <laughs> yeah, maybe a little happens. suspicious. But yeah, I mean, anything can happen. Sure. I think redheads are like a strange anomaly that can yeah, happen in true. any family, but uh, it would be strange to have multiple redheads right. in, a, in a family like that. But whatever, whatever. It's fiction. Yeah. <laughs> we like it. But it's so, it's great. And I, and it's fun recognizing that I, like that I do know a few more Hungarian words than I think, because it's, uh, I think thought yeah. to be between the third and seventh hardest languages in the world. But yeah, there's like an I inside joke that my husband have. So the word for yes in Hungarian is igen. But okay. you'll never hear Hungarian just say igen. Like if you ask them a question, it's okay. never again. It's igen, igen, again. Like they always say it in oh, threes. Okay. And same thing with no, yeah. which is nem. It's always nem, 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 nem. And so like there's okay. a couple of times where uh, she says like igen or nem. And I'm like, a Hungarian did not write Mm-mm. that script because <laughs> yeah. it would definitely be again, 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 or nem, nem, nem. And in fact, we <laughs> went to see cabaret when we were in Mm -hmm. uh, Budapest. And of course it's translated from English into Hungarian. And mm-hmm. in the play, they even said, again, again, again. Aww. <laughs> it's always in threes for some reason. <laughs> Damn. So Russian doll, you slept on that one. Yeah, but, but... <laughs> but great job otherwise. I loved it. It's just great. Mm. <laughs> not to mm. criticize it. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. It's super, one of my favorite shows ever, I would say. Yeah. And uh, I've been watching that and uh, a couple other things that came back for another season that are also not true crime, but just have crimey elements or spooky, thrillery sort of elements. So, so there's the the flight attendant, which <gasps> is back. Um, I forgot that's back. Yeah. Okay, I'm watching that yeah. today. <laughs> the whole and thing then today. Barry, <laughs> no, I think it's only one or two but episodes yeah, out. Why yeah, why not? I bet you can do it. <laughs> but uh, so, and, and Barry, which is mm. uh, uh, Bill Hader as a serial killer who oh, yeah. got really interested in acting <laughs> okay. and just took acting classes and secretly killed in the background. Um, well, for so, anyone yeah, who's ever known fun... actors, that actually sounds like a very likely story. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, and I mean, they're able, like we're just talking about um, Dorothea, you know, masquerading as an old right. lady and putting on this act day in, day out. Like a lot of uh, big time creeps put on a full time right. act, I right. guess. So easy to just slide into the <laughs> acting role. You've already been practicing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. So that's it. Nothing really fresh for me. Um, but uh, yes, lots of good thrillery stuff. Uh, oh, uh, one more continuing. thing we should mention on the what to watch and not, what not to watch. Um, mm. We covered a TikTok on Saturday. Angelina made about um, the um, the tapes the John for Wayne Gacy John Wayne tapes. Gacy. Thank you. Mm. And uh, I would say, like, avoid that if you can. We found out from mm-hmm. a friend of us or of ours, uh, Bob Mata. Mm-hmm. He has a podcast called The Defense Diaries, and he had pitched the idea for this show to Netflix based on the fact that he is in possession of the audio tapes because his dad was Gacy's attorney. Is that correct, Angelina? Mm-hmm. And yeah. and they love the idea. And ran with it and cut him out. Yeah. And they also didn't use his tapes. Apparently, they like they had a couple of other tapes from different people, but they have way less tapes than Bob Mata has. Yeah. Um, way less tapes than he used for his podcast, The Defense Diaries. And um, they just sort of filled it up with some other tapes that were not pre-trial um, interviews with yeah. his uh, defense team. And they just sort of chalked it all up to like, we've got tons of pre-trial footage. And they actually, they don't. it's it's a little bit of a lie. They don't. Yeah, and, I've heard it's not even that great, honestly. Right. They won't be watching. And then also um, they, like the Defense Diaries podcast uh, came upon a huge um, piece of uh, information in the case, which is that the, uh, the primary piece of evidence used to obtain the warrant where they finally searched um, Gacy's property and found um, his victim's bodies 
um, and discovered his dark secret, that primary piece of evidence um, was planted. Wow, interesting. Um, which is not to say that Gacy isn't guilty. Of right. course, the bodies were there. He did kill the people. But um, it does show that the cops who were desperate to solve this and bag Gacy um, did some pretty illegal and sketchy right. things to make that happen, which is interesting. And yeah. it's definitely notable in the case. And to put a show out right after that bomb was dropped and not even mention it, a little bit weird too. <laughs> like yeah, uh, it, it's Bob just, Mata said, well, like he's not um, doing, he's not keeping his uh, journalistic integrity as a documentarian. He should be reporting the whole story and like neglecting to mention that is like right. deliberately being deceitful, I guess. Which, yeah, it's interesting. And uh, mm-hmm. Bob sent us some of the conversations he had had with producers and such. And it's like, mm-hmm. they were like, kind of pumping him for information and making it seem like we're going to work with you. We're going to do this. And then Mm -hmm. we're like, well, we're going to sidebar that for now. And then he just found out it was coming out. out. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. it just (laughs) seems really pretty shady to me. So I'm going to skip that one. Um, I will definitely be Mm -hmm. listening to his podcast, which I have not listened to yet, but um, I've heard really good things about it. It's been on Mm -hmm. several, it's an indie podcast, which is great to support Mm -hmm. indie podcasters, but I've seen it on like best true crime podcast list for ages now, not knowing what it was about. Out. Um, so I'm definitely going to go check. I've seen a lot of out. people tagging it too. Yeah. It sounds pretty solid. Yeah. So go check out the podcast instead of the TV show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that's enough murder for this week. If you require just a little bit more murder, you can get your fill on the OG murder murder dot news with the latest breaking true crime news all week long. You can find us on Instagram at murder murder news on Twitter at mm, Murder News. Mm. You can find us on TikTok at Murder Murder News, where this week we mark the anniversary of the arrest of Joseph D'Angelo, otherwise known as the Golden State Killer, which of course all murderinos know that we kind of felt like mm-hmm. we were there as that was happening a few years mm-hmm. ago. So that's kind of an exciting mm-hmm. date for us. Huge. And yeah. uh, you can also find us on Facebook by searching for Murder Murder News. And while you're on Facebook searching for Murder, Murder News, you'll also see our group pop up. And that group is where you can join our virtual book club. We're just finishing off Underground, the Tokyo Gas Attack and the Japanese Psyche by Haruki Murakami. And we'll be meeting this Sunday on May 1st on Zoom. After that, we're on to our next selection. And the selections for May, June and July will actually be announced today on our Facebook group. So keep your eyes peeled. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or on your preferred podcast platform. If you like what you're hearing, we want to know so we can keep making the true crime podcast episodes that you want to hear. Reviews also help new fans find us and help spread the word that it's worthwhile to tune in to Murder, Murder News. Thanks for listening. Bye, friends. Have a good week. Bye-bye. 